a little bit of a brief outline. So we want to talk about uh, the presentation of muscle invasive bladder cancer. We also want to say, well, this is a common thing uh, that I get asked almost on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. Well, what if I don't do anything? I want to talk about some of the myths and the facts about treatment with curative intent. Uh, we, and then we'll obviously talk about treatment options for curative intent, including radical cystectomy, uh, focusing on what we know, what we don't know, and some expert opinion. And then briefly, briefly touching on uh, trimodal therapy and det determining the equivalence, the selection, and the technique. So uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer is, occurs in about 20 to 30% of patients that initially present with bladder cancer, uh, alternatively 20 to 25% with non-muscle invasive bladder cancers progress to muscle invasive disease over time with most likely being high grade PT1. And what I tell pa all patients is I kind of draw them this picture and say, well, as you can see, you have a muscle invasive tumor, it's more aggressive, it's getting deeper, and therefore that requires more aggressive and invasive treatments. I think a couple of take home points is even when you're thinking about this is patients with T2 disease, when you take out their bladders, Roughly 40% have T3 disease, uh, five to 10% have T4 disease, and about 25% have lymph node positive disease. Um, so that is some of the arguments for the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior uh, to that. So with aggressive disease comes aggressive treatment, and all of these treatments, whether it be cisplatin-based neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapies, radiation therapies, or ileal conduits, or continent urinary stomas, or a neobladder, all occur in elderly patients, which makes this all a very, very difficult thing to deal with. So like I said, there's a lot of patients that come in and say, well, you're telling me that I have to receive chemotherapy, potentially, and or remove my bladder. Uh, what if I just don't do anything? And for a long time, we didn't really know what the natural history of this was, but uh, more recently, over the last few years, a couple of studies have helped us be able to answer that question. So this is the first one. It was published last year it was in the Journal of Urology. This is a Swedish-based study um, over about a 17-year period. And the great thing about uh, all the Scandinavian countries, especially Sweden, Finland, and the right, is they have population health and they have population databases which can answer these questions on a long and large scale. So this is 5,000 patients that did not receive treatment with curative intent. And you can see um, that the overall survival in the bladder cancer specific survival in both men, black line, and then in females in, in red lines is dismal when you don't receive curative intent surgery with a median survival, overall survival of about eight to nine months, and the median disease specific, disease -specific survival of about, a, of about a year. So what I tell patients using some of this data and, and then some other studies that I'll highlight here in a minute is that if you don't do anything you can expect on average to live potentially nine months. Um, this study also looked at, well, you know, we always, we always question, well, you know, what's the morbidity of doing something? Well, what's the morbidity of not doing something? So once again, this is patients that were not treated. Um, on average, about two, uh, there was a 2.1 hospitalizations per, per year, which averaged out to be 18 days in the hospital over that first year after diagnosis, which is much longer than the stay after a radical cystectomy. Most of the causes of hospitalizations in this cohort were related to either bladder cancer or the side effects of bladder cancer, including hematuria, uh, the need to give chemotherapy or radiotherapy, infections, renal disease, uh, and other sorts. And you can also see that even if you plan on not doing anything and not uh, aggressively treating, they still, undergo a fair amount of procedures. So over 30% of patients in this cohort underwent a TURBT, uh, a little over 5% underwent a cystectomy, so a little bit more than that underwent a urinary diversion, and many received nephrostomy tubes, blood transfusions, which certainly lead to the morbidity of doing nothing. Which once again says that doing nothing is not a very good idea, and it's not a very non-morbid idea when compared to the, the supposed morbidity of a cystectomy or radiation therapy. So what about, this is, that was in Sweden, so what about in the United States? Do we undertreat? Um, and this is data using the National Cancer Database, which has its pros and cons, but this is uh, 
is, this looked at over uh, 28,000 patients over a four year period. And the main take home was is that only 52% of patients diagnosed with clinically localized, so that's T2 to T4, N0 disease, had curative intent procedures within this time period. Um, the factors that were associated with no treatment with curative intent were advanced age, racial minorities, the uninsured or the underinsured, so Medicaid patients or government insurances, and the low and being diagnosed at low volume centers. And this is a nice bar graph uh, that looks at this uh, with age over time. Um, observation is in the kind of light blue shaded, and you can see the observation almost exponentially increases as age goes up, and then the gold standard of treatment would be surgery, and that kind of exponentially goes down as age goes up. And that is kind of something that we'll talk about, some of the myths of treating patients, especially elderly patients, uh, with treatment with curative intent. So the most recent data, uh, and, and this is nice because it did an actual comparison of observation versus treatment with curative intent, whether that be trimodal therapy or uh, cystectomy. This was recently published a month or two ago in BGUI, and this has been presented at the SCOO and other meetings. Um, this is a very small study, once again, out of Sweden, looking at a cohort between 1994 and 1995, diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer that was clinically localized. About 130 patients met this uh, criteria. Roughly half didn't have therapy and half did. And I just present the median overall survival and the median metastasis-free survival Kaplan-Meier curves here. So you can see the uh, extreme difference. So once again, if you don't have treatment, your median overall survival is about nine months. If you do have treatment, your median overall survival is 42 months. And I often get the question, well, doctor, you're saying that I'm only going to live about four years even if I do have this therapy. Well, this is overall survival in an older population. So we're not looking at disease specific survival. We're, that's likely incorporating a lot of the patient age and the comorbidities into that anyway. So I, I often try to tell patients that hopefully we can get you to live longer, but this is just overall survival in the sick cohort. You can also see that the metastasis uh, free survival is, is much, long, uh, much worse in patients with no therapy. So what are the take home uh, points from these studies? Well, the recent Swedish study is, is very small. It's 126 patients. So is, they were diagnosed in the early 90s from a single country. So is this data generalizable? Well, it probably is, but it's small and it's limited, uh, but it's the best data that we have. And then using those other two studies, I think it offers uh, us a lot of information to tell our patients. I think the biggest thing is, is that about 50% of patients with muscle invasive disease don't receive any treatment with curative intent. And I think this is a major need for us to improve, especially given the results of doing nothing. So there are some reasons why that I think that this is happening. Potentially it's age, potentially it's the complications of treatment, potentially it's the morbidity or quality of life after treatment. A lot of it has to do with lack of patient education and these patients require a long time to talk with them about all the various aspects of, uh, of care and the need for uh, experienced providers to provide this care. And I believe that these are mostly modifiable uh, risk factors and we must do better. And then I think the second aspect is I'm a surgeon, I'm pro-surgery in this cohort because it's ap applicable to almost all comers, um, whereas trimodal therapy is very selected and should remain to be very selected. But I think that if, if patients are going to say um, that I'm, you know, refuse the cystectomy, I'm not going to have this done, we have to appropriately counsel them on trying to do trimodal therapy if they're appropriate candidates and sometimes even bending the rules if they're not in order to try to get them benefit. So let's talk about some of the myths and the facts uh, about treatment with curative intent, uh, playing off of a lot of the things that I had just mentioned. So the elderly and life expectancy is a very difficult topic. I think that it, this is something that's mentioned almost nearly every uh, conference that we have on Wednesday mornings, almost every uh, tumor board discussion uh, here and everywhere within the world. There is a lot of data in a lot of different publications looking at prostate cancer and life expectancy. And that makes sense, right? So prostate cancer ultimately is not going to be the cause of death for most of the time 
a decade or more, even after therapy. So deciding, you know, life expectancy in those po in that population is extremely important to try to prevent the morbidities of therapy and only treat those that are going to need it. It's not necessarily that uh, applicable to bladder cancer. There is no studies currently published looking at life expectancy in bladder cancer patients. That's likely due to the morbidity of not doing anything. So time is of the essence really in these situations. It doesn't really matter about life expectancy because if you don't treat anything, we can know that their life expectancy is very, very short. Um, so that's a lot of what I had just talked about. There's really no da data that talks about life expectancy calculators in patients with bladder cancer. And this is due to the uh, uh, untreated muscle invasive bladder cancer being lethal. Uh, and prostate cancer patients can live unaffected for decades. And my take home is, is I would not use the life expectancy argument in the management of bladder cancer unless the risk of treatment is prohibitory uh, from proceeding. So the other things that we need to look at is, well, what if we do treat these older patients? And there is a lot of studies looking at the treatment of older patients. Is it really worse than treating younger patients? Uh, so this is a study in uh, 2012 from the Journal of Urology. This was out of Memorial Stone Kettering. So it is a single institution retrospective review looking at um, over 1,100 uh, patients that underwent cystectomy over a, a 10 or 11 year period. And essentially they dichotomized their groups into those that are older than 80 and those that are longer, uh, younger than 80. And on the left is table three from their manuscript, looking at complications stratified by age groups. And sure, there were slightly uh, higher complications in certain areas, most likely neurologic, which is self-explanatory, and cardiac, which is also self-explanatory. But if you look at the differences between minor and major grade complications, there was really no difference. And this kind of uh, trend plays out in numerous publications looking at the effect of age uh, at the time of cystectomy and outcomes. On the right is uh, disease specific survival curves and competing risk curves for those that are 80 uh, or older. Uh, this isn't necessarily a cumulative, uh, cumulative incidence of events curves the, with the way that it's shaped. Um, and you can see that death from disease or uh, stratified based on age is really no different uh, when you look at age as a factor. The authors then conclude that age should not be a prohibitory uh, in offering patients therapy. So this is a shout out to Megan uh, who helped publish this study, I, I guess in medical school. This was recently done uh, in the Euro, uh, European Urology Focus in 2019. This once again used our National Cancer Database and they wanted to compare perioperative outcomes in those aged 70 to 79 versus those that are greater than 80 and do outcomes really differ. And you can see, well, there are some weak short-term endpoints. Length of stay was marginally uh, longer uh, in those that are octogenarians. Mortality was a few uh, points, but within the normal range uh, of what is expected, the 90-day mortality after this surgery is 1% to 3%, slightly higher in those that are 80. And the wound infection, interestingly, uh, rate was quite low. But if you look at complications in general, um, they're really no different between those that are 70 and 79 versus those that are greater than 80. And certainly there are issues with the way these and other studies are done, but this once again adds to the increasing evidence that suggests that age should not be a prohibitory factor. Well, that wasn't supposed to pop up, but anyways, I'll just gloss over the, that other one. Uh, it just essentially says the same thing. And it also says that if you aggressively treat these patients, so if you look at uh, radical cystectomy with chemotherapy versus trimodal therapy, there's no difference and the outcomes are great. But if you compare them to chemotherapy alone or radiation therapy alone in the elderly, the outcomes are inferior. Um, once again, saying that if you can aggressively treat these patients, the outcomes are always better despite the age. So a couple of the facts that I wanted to spell that, yes, elderly patients are less likely to be treated with curative intent. We know that. We saw some of the uh, 
exponential uh, increases in observation over, over age. But surgery in the elderly is feasible. We just had two 80-year-olds on our service, and they did fairly well. Um, and comorbidities, rather than age, I think drive the outcome. Uh, morbidity, like I tell all patients, is similar. Despite your age, it's going to be driven by your comorbidities. Uh, chemo radiation therapy, based on the last one that didn't really pop up, uh, has comparable oncological outcomes in this cohort. However, there's really an unknown degree of morbidity. I believe we all think that, oh, if we just give them chemotherapy and we irradiate them for four or five weeks, their morbidity is much less than a cystectomy. And I don't think we can actually answer that question. There is actually some data that suggests that the morbidity is, is fairly high of radiation therapy, especially in the older uh, folks. And the bottom line is that I believe more elderly patients should be considered for treatments uh, of curative intent. So let's talk a little bit about complications. We all kind of know this story. There's a lot of different data uh, to suggest that the overall complication rates, this is all comers, all claving grades, is about 30 to 60%, probably on the higher end when you talk about radical cystectomy. Um, have we made changes? Now, there's a lot of things that we're trying to do to make this better, whether it's ERAS, whether it's robotics, whether it's a whole bunch of different things. Have these changed over time or are they fairly persistent? So this is a study published in 2017 in Neurologic Oncology by the group in Chicago, essentially looking over a five to six year period of complication rates after cystectomy and then specific ones. Uh, you Going a, uh, a, B, C, and D. So A is looking at the percent with total complications. And in this study, it's relatively on the low end, uh, which may be related, uh, related to data capture, but it's anywhere between 30 and 33%, and it doesn't really change. The uh, B is the transfusion rate, which has gone down. The average length of stay is going down. Uh, however, the readmission rate is fairly the same. So this is going to be a trend that we talk about when we talk about ERAS, when we talk about robotics, and we talk about their real utility in the management of these patients. Um, we can see that we can move the needle on length of stay. We can reduce the rate of transfusion. We can potentially reduce the rates of ileus. Um, but we're ultimately, in, in this study and in other studies, we're not really changing the big drivers of issues of the surgery, which is the complication rate and the readmission rate, which are relatively unchanged. And we just have to do better uh, through a variety of, of ways. Um, this is probably the most cited paper looking at early morbidity after radical cystectomy. So this is uh, 2009. This is all out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it's, it, I don't know, I guess it makes me feel a, a little bit better because it, it tells you, one, their number of cystectomies over the course of the years. And then looking at their short and, and or uh, uh, ma minor and major complications and their rates uh, of some complications are there. Uh, in the actual percentages, and they're high. And that's probably a highest, uh, very, very high volume center, well known for doing uh, aggressive bladder cancer surgeries. And over time, their minor and major complication rates have been relatively stable, and their total complication rates uh, range anywhere from 50 to 73%. Um, so when you're looking at this, we talked about the range of complications. I tell most patients that most of these complications are minor. So wound infections, urinary tract infections, and ileus. There are certain things that I believe we can do to potentially limit those, whether they're the use of albumapam and other different medications, whether they're wounds uh, in UTIs, whether it's a prophylactic antibiotic or a wound protector. But still there are 10 to 15% of the clavian grade three or higher major complications with a two to 3% 90-day mortality which may be a little higher, up to 4% uh, in the 80 and over category. So overall, we just have to do better. Nothing's really moved the needle, um, especially over the last 10 to 15 years. But how are we going to do that is, is something that we're challenged with. And I think that's the biggest question in the management of these patients. So some suggestions, maybe it's prehab. If we can make this, these patients better going into surgery, maybe they'll do better afterwards. Maybe it's just referrals to uh, high volume centers because there's a, a plethora of data, which we'll talk about that if you do more of these and you care for more of these patients, you're probably going to have better outcomes than those that don't. Potentially it's ERAS, potentially it's robotics, potentially it's both. Uh, and 
potentially post-habilitation, really working with these patients aggressively, whether at home or at rehab, uh, to try to minimize some of the things that can happen. Uh, we also talked about, well, cystectomy and quality of life, because a lot of people ask me about the quality of life after surgery. And there are a lot of different instruments to evaluate this. There's EORTC, there's the Vanderbilt uh, Index. There's many different things to look at, lots of different aspects of quality of life. And there's a few uh, moderate amount of studies actually investigating this. However, they're all very limited. So they're all, retros for the most part, they're all retrospective. A lot of them are cross-sectional, so one data point. Um, and they often don't control for other things that may affect these endpoints, such as their age, their comorbidities, their baseline uh, quality. So this is one that at least I wanna highlight, one because it's newer and I think that it also uh, tries to get around some of those limitations. So this was a 2019 study looking at a Germany cohort, single institution, essentially comparing uh, non-continent urinary diversion or ileal conduits with orthotropic neobladders. Uh, those are the red lines. And this study is unique because it is longitudinal. So it looks at preoperative assessments, three months, 12 months, and uh, 24 months, comparing between the two diversion types. It also uh, did a propensity score matching for some of the co confounding variables that we mentioned, age, um, baseline, comorbidity. So this is really trying to take in uh, to consideration all the factors that may affect quality of life. So on the left is their graphs looking at kind of just general categories of global health, uh, cognitive functioning, social functioning, emotional functioning. And then on the right is uh, symptom specific. So those would be like shortness of breath, fatigue, insomnia, nausea, vomiting. Uh, I don't necessarily want to focus on the difference between uh, continent and non-continent aversion. I just don't think that that's necessarily that important. But essentially just focus on the, the curve. So yes, things tend to uh, be better pre-op and, and get worse at three months, but then things improve and they essentially stable out. So if you look at the differences between pre-op to 24 months, the the overall change is not that significant in most of those outcomes. So my bottom line when I talk to patients is, is that yes, your short-term quality of life will be impaired. Um, not having a bladder, not having those routine functioning is going to be difficult, but the alternative is not very tolerable either. So um, this kind of summarizes a lot of that. Um, I would, I would uh, mention that there is very little uh, comparison between quality of life after surgery and radiation therapy. That's something that potentially can be looked at uh, in the future. Uh, and the last concept, uh, volume is key. I think we know this. This is, this is in multiple, multiple studies. I'll shout out Simon Kim uh, and him while well, he was at Mayo or whether he was here and still working with Mayo. I uh, did one study looking at surgical volume and in, uh, in complication rates. And you can see that the high volume centers, this is on the left of the screen, the high volume centers in blue had lower rates of complications into the low 20s than the low and medium uh, volume centers. And then on the right, this is looking at another nationwide database. This is out of Vanderbilt uh, almost a decade plus ago, looking at the mortality rate based on volume and your mortality rate is at the higher end of this quoted spectrum if you do fewer cases a year, and it gets better uh, and lower if you do more cases a year, and this is all kind of intuitive anyways. So I say this is a tale as old as time, higher volume equals better outcomes. Um, there are studies looking at surgeon volume versus hospital volume, and I think both are very important. So the surgeon, obviously, the more experienced, uh, the better. However, it's really a hospital volume, and that's played out in a couple of studies. So the hospital is important because they have a lot of the different ancillary services. They have pathways to help get these patients through the surgeries quickly and efficiently. They may have more access to multidisciplinary teams, um, which all improve care. Um, 
some of, there are significant bar barriers to this. Um, I think in our system uh, is different than some of the Europeans because some of the Europeans, they have des uh, centers, especially in the Netherlands and, and some other countries have uh, bladder cancer designated hospitals. So they, they have criteria whether you should perform cystectomies or not based on volume and outcomes. Um, our healthcare system is very fragmented. So it is very hard to move within healthcare systems uh, and between healthcare systems. So it doesn't necessarily allow the patients to travel very easy, uh, easily, even uh, if care may be uh, improved. That also is a factor of insurance coverage. Um, I've been denied many a different patients because their insurance isn't covered uh, by our hospital system. That is a problem. Uh, and, and potentially can limit their abilities uh, to access centers that potentially do more of these than others. Our country is also very uh, spread out and there are certainly bigger travel concerns and social and travel concerns, uh, their social status, their economic status also play a part of this. And I think the one thing that we'll, we'll never get, be able to get past is, is ego um, and the referrals from other providers for these surgeries is something that will always be uh, will always be there. So those are kind of dispelling some of the myths of potentially why uh, only 50% of patients with muscle invasive disease uh, get treatment. So let's talk about treatment with curative intent uh, for the time being and talk about some of the things that I think are important uh, specifically focusing on cystectomies, uh, but then also talking a little bit about trimodal therapy. So if the doc, uh, if patient comes in and he goes, hey doc, what are my options? Well, uh, that would be either a radical cystectomy or trimodal therapy. And in a radical cystectomy in males, as we all know, it's the bladder, the prostate, and the, the SVs. And probably about 10 to 25% of, of patients ask me, well, what about sexual function when you're doing all of this? What about nerve sparing or prostate sparing even? Because that's been looked at. Well. I have a few issues with that. Um, it has to be a very, very thoughtful and select patient. We know in general, we understage uh, bladder cancer fairly significantly, whether it's the uh, uh, not deep enough TORs, whether it's the imaging that's just not quite perfect. Um, and some of the things that I talked about at the very beginning. So even with muscle invasive disease, there is about a 40% of those patients having T3 disease and about 5% of those have T4 disease. So if you're talking about sparing tissue on the sides of the bladder to potentially, to potentially allow them to have better sexual function, you are sacrificing potentially oncologic cure in a lethal disease. It's not like prostate. So that's one of my major issues. Um, in the short term, there have been some studies, these are very, very small studies, looking at nerve sparing uh, and the effectiveness of nerve sparing in bladders. And there's really a lack of efficacy in this situation. Uh, most of that is due to the fact that you are operating on older men, even older men than prostate, with poor preoperative function. And the excision uh, is a little bit different. Uh, and you have multiple areas where you can injure the nerves. So it's not that efficacy efficacious even if, you, uh, even if you do it. From a prostate uh, sparing, people have looked at that, but we know that the incidental rate of prostate cancer in these patients, whether significant or not, is there and up to 30 to, 40, uh, 30 to 60%. We also know that bladder cancers based on location and or severity can extend into the prostate or into the prostatic urethra, which would obviously sacrifice your oncological cures uh, if you did that. So my party line is I will do it in certain situations. Uh, I think the high grade T1s, refractory to BCG or early cystectomies are probably the optimal candidate, but we, we have to say that within consideration that they have to have great preoperative function. It has to be something that they're, they're pushing for. And we have to try to see if we can better stage them beforehand, because even the high grade T1s, if you operate on them, you're likely going to find more aggressive disease. From a female, uh, a radical cystectomy normally, normally includes the bladder plus or minus the uterus, the tubes, the ovaries, the anterior vagina, and the ure urethra. We often ask this question, is this all necessary? So uh, Sam Chang, when I think he was at Memorial Stone Kettering years and years ago for fellowship, looked at this and so like only 5% of, of the cases when we remove all of this uh, have gynecological organ involvement. Um, and I think this is, it plays an important role in the female neobladder and really thinking about selection is key. So the female neobladder really was something that 
used to never really be done and is starting to gain a little bit more traction, but you have to leave the urethra in entirety. Normally you have to leave the entire vagina in in entirety and potentially leave the cervix uh, and the uterus for uh, support because otherwise you're going to have issues with prolapse afterwards. I think I see Emily, so maybe she can talk about uh, some of that uh, as things go forward. Um, the problem is, uh, is that selection is key. So you really have to do a vaginal sparing approach because you don't want to oppose suture lines because if you oppose suture lines, when you fix the vagina and you put a neobladder down there, the likelihood of fistula is quite high. The other thing is, is we understage females and we also know that females have more aggressive disease on, uh, on pathology when we remove everything and they have worse outcomes. So are, are we really doing the right service with poor staging by doing this? It has to be the select patient, so it can't be a bladder neck tumor. It's really not great if it's a high volume tumor. So the amount of selection uh, that we have to do here is very, it has to be very, very thoughtful. Going on to trimodal therapy, this has to be done in the right way. And I think oftentimes, either here or in the community, it's not done in completeness. So it has to include an aggressive and visually complete TUR. It has to include radiosensitizing chemotherapy and there's many different choices for that. And it has to include radiation therapy, which either can be do, done as a split dose or a continuous dose schedule, but patient selection is key. So what about surgery? Obviously everybody knows that this is the gold standard. It has excellent local control. The pelvic relapse rates are less than 4%. It's got the downsides of being invasive and highly morbid as we've talked about and non-negligible 90 uh, day mortality. So let's talk a little bit about what we know, what we don't know and some expert opinions uh, on this. My animations are, are the worst. Um, <laughs> Good thing. Anyways, uh, let's see. I'll get out of the slideshow for a second. So these are, uh, and I'll read. So these are two um, studies published uh, 15 to 20 years ago, looking at the time of treatment. This is something that is very, very important today as we speak, especially in the COVID-19. So this is looking at intervals and it's 12 weeks and I can't really speak to why 12 weeks was uh, decided at this point in time, but it was. Uh, on the left was the original, one of the more original articles in 2003, looking at patients that were treated beyond 12 weeks from the initial diagnosis with definitive therapy versus those that were treated prior to that. Now this is comparing a, a larger population to a, to a smaller population. And obviously there are issues with that, but the rate of T3 disease or, or worse or N positive disease was 84% in those that waited 12 weeks versus 42% of those that didn't. And if you look at the survival uh, of those groups, there is a, a, a quick uh, and significant uh, separation of the curve. So those that, excuse me, had therapy quicker, did better than those that didn't. Um, this data that was then confirmed uh, using the SEER database in 2009, uh, 2009. And essentially when, they, when you look at the curves and if you group patients uh, under eight weeks and eight to 12 weeks, their outcomes are uh, significantly better and the curves significantly separate than those that had delay in over 12 weeks. And let me move this back up. Um, like I said, this is, uh, this is an important concept to think about and why we are still doing cystectomies, even though uh, potentially that can be debated in this uh, circumstances. Patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer should have an expedited evaluation by a multidisciplinary team. I think that that is true for all cases. And we should do everything in our power to start definitive management uh, within 12 weeks. And this is, for me, either a a data surgery if we're going straight forward to surgery or the start of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. If this isn't, we have to get neoadjuvant chemotherapy done in 12 weeks and then surgery. This is, we have to start one or these other, one or two of those approaches uh, that are equivalents in definitive therapy. Um, 
Like I said, we talked about what this means during COVID. Um, currently, there's a national debate uh, on a couple aspects of this. One, should we still be doing these? Should we hold off for a month? There is national debate whether or not we should use chemotherapy uh, in, in this situation uh, or not. Uh, and there's really no consensus. Uh, there's some discussion about uh, using off-labeled IO therapy, uh, which can be more tolerable and sometimes delivered at home versus other treatments as temporary measures until we get past the significant aspects of this. Um, and just to highlight, uh, there is a Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network is uh, presentation, I believe sometime on Wednesday, uh, regarding what to do for these patients where timing to treatment is essential uh, in the hardest hit regions. So this is run by a lot of the people in New York City right now who are not doing any cancer operations, uh, at least any bladder cancer operations, they are shut down for over a month. Perfect. I should have probably looked at this from an animation standpoint. Um, all right, so <laughs> I looked at everything else. All right, so what, what we don't know then uh, here is who should get neoadjuvant chemotherapy? We do not know that. We do know that neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, plus cystectomy is better than cystectomy alone in certain patients. So this is kind of a landmark study of what this is all based on. This is 2003, this is, was a SWOG cooperative group study and essentially looked at dose dense, or not dose dense, but MVAC chemotherapy, so a four drug regimen compared to the more popular uh, two drug regimen, gemcitabine and cisplatinum. Essentially what they looked at is they randomized patients to receive chemotherapy and then surgery to su surgery alone. And on the left, you can see the, the survival curves and there is a uh, distinct separation and an improvement in overall survival in those patients that got chemotherapy versus surgery alone. And this is why that recommendation uh, is, this is what that's based on. When I tell patients when I'm counseling them in clinic is, well, what's, what's the take home from this and why do we do it? Well, there is a five, if you look at here with the separation of the curves, there's a five to 10% overall survival benefit at five years. So if I say 50 to 55 out of 100 patients, if we treat you just with surgery, we'll be alive at five years. This is alive from any cause. If we give chemotherapy prior to that, we can increase that number from 60 to 65, and it allows that data to potentially be a little bit more applicable to uh, our patient population. On the right, this is really stratifying uh, patients based on chemotherapy or upfront sur surgery, and then their pathological status at the time of surgery. And this is something that has played out uh, multiple, multiple times is patients with no residual disease, so PT0, YPT0, at the time of cystectomy, do better than those that have residual disease. That concept is not that hard to understand. But those patients that uh, had chemotherapy versus those that had cystectomy with no residual disease, it's about the same. Um, and we can say that the overall survival in that cohort uh, with no residual disease is the best. It's in about 80% uh, overall survival at five years. So once again, fixing my animations. Um, this was level one evidence, and this was published in 2003. And then decades later, we knew that the use of new adjuvant chemotherapy was quite low. And this was in, in the range of 10 to 20%. And this has been published uh, looking at multiple databases and institutional settings, but why? Well, picking a patient uh, is tough. So our patient cohort, as we've already talked, is older. They're comorbid, comorbid. And if they can't get cisplatinum, because we know that carboplatinum is not uh, an effective substitute, if they're not cisplatinum eligible, then they're really not eligible for chemotherapy. Some patient or some providers uh, that didn't necessarily believe in the benefits of chemotherapy hang on the, the belief that it is over treatment in some patients. Um, and I would agree with this, that chemotherapy is over treatment in some patients. And this is partially due to uh, poor staging. And there is 50% of patients with a that have a surgical cure for PT2 disease, which is reasonable. The other question is, is well, who benefits? And, and this is something that we're gonna talk about again in the next upcoming slides is some people respond, some people have stable disease and some people progress well in chemotherapy. And a lot of the people that don't wanna do neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that 
For those that progress, we have a fear of delaying curative intent surgery. And obviously there are toxicities when it comes to chemotherapy. Um, so more to that point, what we don't know, so who should get it? Well, it's importance of patient characteristics. Each case is individual and requires a discussion. So each case has to be decided. I, we just operated on the patient with a squamous cell and squamous cells normally do respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but she got the squamous cell cancer because she was a long-term in and out catheterization and a recurrent UTI due to a neurogenic bladder. For me, because she was gonna to need to continue that during the neoadjuvant chemotherapy era, it didn't really make any sense for us to do that because we're not taking away the inciting incident um, from, from that situation while we're getting it. Maybe that was right, maybe that was wrong. That is something that we will, I guess, never know, but it's a case-by-case -case situation. There are some issues with variant histology. We've talked about squamous and their response, but this is really a diagnosis dilemma. Uh, and this is because there is discordance. So there's discordance between the TUR path and the cystectomy path. Sometimes you see a variant on TUR that's not on the final pathology and vice versa. Um, there is also a significant discordance rate when you're looking at community red pathology versus academic centers. Obviously, if you're looking at it from an academic GU trained pathologist, you're more likely going to pick up on these uh, variant histologies, probably because you're looking for them. Um, but this discordance has been published and it's almost 30 to 40% in some situations. There's a lot of missing data in this situation, but I guess in my opinion, uh, and this is somewhere where potentially some at least thoughtful opinion, pure urothelial cells, most squamous glandulars, and certainly all uh, small cells should be considered for neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the small cells getting a different type of chemotherapy, that's VP16 or carboplatinum and etoposide. For cystectomy first, and this can be debated, especially with micropapillary because the retrospective data from multiple institutions um, is kind of contradictory uh, to one, uh, one another. I normally tend to think that micropapillary, if localized, should be operated on. Certainly plasma cytoid would be because the only time you can cure those patients is when it hasn't spread. And plasma cytoid is a very unique variant that spreads along tissue planes, especially spreads up beyond and along the ureters and makes those surgeries quite difficult. And or sarcomatoids. Um, you, most of the time, uh, so Gina asked if, you, if we do surgery for small cells. Um, in my uh, you know, limited, I guess, experience, what we used to do is we, all patients um, would get BP-16 if they're localized, localized to the bladder, because you're more likely going to fail when you're a small cell systemically than local. If you're localized and you don't progress, then we would normally have done a cystectomy. We would not have done radiation therapy. But this is coming from uh, training, and it's probably shaped my beliefs that I do not really like radiation therapy uh, for bladder cancers for a multitude of reasons, um, and maybe that, and certainly that's biased. Um, but no, so if it's, if it's elsewhere, obviously you don't touch it, um, and it's systemic and systemic otherwise, but we would do systemic first. And if it's just a localized small, then within the bladder, no evidence of metastatic disease, we would go and do it. Whether it be right or wrong, I don't know. All right, so there are, um, so to answer this question of who should not, to try to pick out those that are going to respond and benefit from chemotherapy versus those that are not gonna respond uh, with chemotherapy, there have been a lot of different studies, and I'll try to touch base and summarize them the best that I can, looking at circulating tumor cells, circulating DNA, and molecular subtypes, with a caveat that all of this gives me a, a headache. Um, so circulating tumor cells have been looked at, uh, CTCs are detected using uh, EP cams. So these are cell surface uh, receptors and proteins uh, with the knowledge that about 96% of patients with muscle invasive bladder cancers have uh, these on the surface. Uh, we know, and we've already talked about that 50% of patients with a radical cystectomy uh, progress, but only 20% of, of these patients have detectable circulating tumor cells. In one study, uh, this is in urologic oncology in 2017, the CTCs correlated with radiographic detected disease, but it wasn't all that great. So CTCs were elevated in patients with 
uh, pet positive disease in 34% of the time, but were also present in 8% of pet negative cases. And from studies, we know that circulating tumor cells didn't really predict the risk of uh, metastasis with normal imaging, the risk of extra vesicle disease and the time of cystectomy or the risk of cancer specific survival. Um, I think more, a more promising approach to this would be the circulatory DNA, which is essentially the quote unquote liquid biopsy, which is what everyone is shooting for in the cancer space these days. Um, this is very interesting because it can, it can be used to monitor disease status and volume prior to and during therapy. There's a 14% detection rate in muscle invasive disease uh, with rates rising in those that have metastatic disease. And this can also pick up targetable somatic mutations. So these are P53s, RB1s, uh, FGR uh, that are important in treatment planning. So this is a study uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, which is probably the biggest and most impactful oncology journal. Um, this was done in 2019. I would just, um, I can share the slides, but take some time to look at these because it's, it's fairly uh, significant data. So if you could detect uh, circulating DNA prior to um, treatments, whether it be prior to chemotherapy, prior, before cystectomy, or after cystectomy, you can see that those that had circulatory DNA did far, far worse. And you could also predict the, uh, the staging, uh, those that had less than, greater than T1 or less than T1, and those that would recur or not recur based on circulatory DNA. So this could certainly help drive therapies, um, potentially with, uh, with patients with circulatory DNA being positive at the time of diet, after TURBT, maybe you give them chemotherapy and see if, if that diminishes after chemotherapy. Um, maybe with those patients that got completely resected and you're questioning the need for adjuvant therapies, whether they be uh, more chemotherapy or immunotherapy or some trial, you could potentially stratify those patients a little bit better based on their circulatory DNA. If it's positive, you're likely going to recur and therefore you should potentially get therapy sooner rather than waiting. Um, this is probably something that will continue to be an important aspect in selecting patients for therapies as time goes on. So the last thing... In it, Maybe I missed this, but does tumor volume, is that correlated with the circulatory DNA, like ability to, ability to pick up the circulatory DNA? Yeah, so... Uh, Obviously, the, the ability to, to find that is, is better and or is, is increased in metastatic settings. So your volume is going to be higher. Um, obviously, I think you're picking up vol uh, some component of volume, but that I'm not sure. So the last, uh, the last concept is molecular subtypes. So there are countless, countless studies trying to look at molecular subtypes a bladder cancer to look at their unique genomic signatures to then also try to say, well, what's the natural history of this? So are variants more likely in this one or this one? Are they more likely to respond to chemotherapy or not? Should we use chemotherapy or not? And these are very important questions, but these papers are horrible to read. Um, especially prior to this most recent one that was re uh, recently published like last month or, or two, there is a lot of different testing and there are a lot of different classifications. So there are P53s and basals and luminals and stroma riches and basal squamous. And there were multiple centers that were trying to get in, in on this to, to group patients, whether it be a Lund criteria, MD Anderson, a UNC, there was so much. So this is the group that have, you know, these are important players in, in, in this and they got together and they tried to look at the molecular signatures of all of all of their data and combined it to try to find out with some unified classification system. Um, and they kind of focused on these six areas, so luminal papillary, luminal nonspecified, luminal unstable, stroma rich, basal squamous, and the neuroendocrines. And you can see that survival is different based on the type that you classify in. The clinical characteristics are different. Women are more likely in some, older patients are more likely in some, more advanced stages. You can look at the mutations that are more likely to be seen in certain types, which may lead to targetable uh, 
medications, whether in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant space. There are some patients or some areas that respond to chemotherapy and some that, that, that don't. So this is going to be something that we continue to hear about, especially over the next decade or two, as we try to answer that question of what we don't know, is yes, chemo, chemotherapy is helpful, but sometimes it's not. And we need to pick the people that would be most benefit from it. And this may be a potential way that we do it. There are going to be some problems in doing this uh, widespread because this is in obviously select research institutions and they've used a variety of different tests before all of this and different subclassifications. So maybe having this consensus statement will help us. We're gonna to have to be able to do this at multiple, multiple centers, especially in our country, if this is going to be uh, uh, substantial. So what are some next frontiers? Obviously, uh, Chris Holmes, before he has, I think, left us, has been looking at immuno-oncology in the new adjuvant space. Uh, these are some trials that uh, we've uh, help, uh, helped and contributed to here, and we also did during fellowship. And this is looking at combined therapy with either, uh, uh, he's looking at uh, pembrolizumab or one of the different PDL1 or other immunotherapies combined with cisplatin and uh, chemotherapy or alone. There was recently a pure trial that I believe that was specifically done in Europe looking at uh, pembrolizumab alone. So when you use it alone, there are comparable complete response rates to uh, and overall response rates with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is on the realm of about 40%. And obviously the response is better in those with PDL1 uh, or PD1 positive patients, but it doesn't mean that PDL1 or PD1 negative patients don't respond. It's just that there is a better response. Um, when you use in combination with cisplatin and based chemotherapy, there's comparable uh, uh, pathological complete response rates and higher overall response rates. And I believe that this potentially has a significant benefit in those patients that are cisplatin and ineligible. Um, if ASCO would have gone on this year, we would have, we submitted and had a, a pretty important abstract, I believe, uh, looking into to gemcitabine and pembrolizumab in the cisplatin and ineligible patients and showing that the pathological complete response, which is used as a surrogate uh, in this situation for overall and other oncological outcomes, uh, was uh, similar uh, to those with receiving cis or what has been reported with those receiving cisplatin or cisplatin in combination with pembrolizumab. Um, some of the other aspects is if we can increase the pathological complete response rates even higher, what's the chance of doing bladder preservation, especially for those that are in the YPT0, which I said have the best overall survival, but they also are going through the cystectomy um, with some potential morbidity for unclear benefit. Well, there are single institution and small multi-institutional studies, most recently published last year. This was Columbia and uh, MSK, and it's mostly Harry Hers data, who's an older urologic oncologist who had uh, in a very select uh, group of cohorts after neoadjuvant chemotherapy would take them back for TURBT. And if that TURBT was negative, then he would or they would not do cystectomies. And it showed that this was feasible in a very select, uh, highly specialized centers. And I don't know if it's applicable, but potentially that is something that is being looked at. Um, the word of caution about that is there's been other papers that suggest that even if that TURBT is negative, because often we're taking TURBTs in that situation of a scar, because we don't know where the original tumor was because it was a referred from an outside center. Um, even in the negative settings that they went to cystectomies, uh, greater than 60% had pathological disease uh, with 25% having PT3 or N0 disease, uh, which is obviously a concern if you're going to watch patients with a presumed complete response. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about pelvic lymph node dissections. Uh, so we know the pelvic lymph node dissection should be performed. It requires a thorough and meticulous dissection. We know that because 25% of patients uh, with muscle invasive disease has, have positive lymph nodes. And we know that lymph node status, uh, especially lymph node positive, is the strongest predictor for long-term recurrence free and overall survival. Uh, and we know that patients with lymph node positive disease or PT3 disease or higher are candidates for adjuvant therapy or enrollment in a lot of the adjuvant therapy trials. 
What we don't know is really the extent of uh, pelvic lymph node uh, dissection. And this is some degree of surgeon bravado. Yes, we can remove all of these nodes, but what does it matter? Um, so this is the best level one evidence that we have to date. This is uh, a European phase three randomized perspective uh, clinical trial. And there is some issues with all of this, but the bottom line is, is they randomized patients to a limited pelvic lymph node dissection, which is uh, below this first line. So it'd be like five, nine, and 10. So it's the internal, the superficial obturator. I don't know why they uh, separated the, just the obturator into two packets. I don't know. The, it's the internal, the external, and the obturator versus doing this entire huge dissection up to the level of the, uh, up to the, level of the IMA, uh, taking the interaortic cables, the periortics, the paracables, the commons, the presacrals, and all of these lymph nodes. And if you look at it, and their main outcome, this was all powered for a recurrence-free survival, which ha was defined in a little bit of a conspicuous uh, way. There was really no difference, and there was really no difference in cancer-specific survival over time nor uh, overall survival over time. Um, so there is another trial looking at the SWOG, uh, it's a SWOG trial um, looking at uh, uh, a normal pelvic lymph node versus an extended. So that's up to the, the level of the iliac bifurcations. That's going to, to result here in the next couple of years. That'll be interesting. There's a lot of, my, my main issue uh, with this is Yes, we can do it, um, but is it going to be beneficial? It adds a significant amount of time. In this study, the rate of high-grade lymphocytes needing a drain was higher. The higher you go up, that's not surprising, and, and we're not doing it for really any benefit. Um, so just because we can doesn't mean that we should, and I tend to do a dissection that's normally to the, the iliac bifurcation. Uh, not that the internal and the external line normally go up here. The, these are the uppers that I'll take. Uh, are kind of in this situation and the lowers are down here. I don't know. Um, what I think, and, and this, is, this is more of an opinion, is lymph node yield is bogus. So we can do these comparisons in all sorts of studies that are looking at cancer, comparing uh, lymph node uh, yield across studies to say if they're equivalent or not, um, I think that is just bogus. Um, it's bogus when you're looking at robotics to open, with technique to technique, lymph node yield should really not be used um, because most of the ones that are trying to make, the, most studies that are trying to make this comparison are single institution retrospective, not randomized. And lymph node yield is so biased. So it's limited on the pathologist. If you ask them to look for more, they'll give you more. Uh, it's limited by, based on their interests. Um, if you send more packets, so if you send more packets, just as they did in that, uh, that controlled trial that we talked about last, you're normally going to get more nodes, but does that lead to better outcomes? No, not really. Um, I totally believe that surgeons are really limited by, they're only able to remove the tissue that they can see and that, that, that is there. If there's less nodes or more nodes, that's not up to them. They're just trying to remove it. And I, what I think lymph node yield is best interpreted is, is that this may be a, a marker for node sampling. So those patients that don't do a thorough, or those individuals that don't do a thorough meticulous node dissection versus those that, that do. Um, so what we don't know uh, also is operative technique. Um, and this is gonna be a little bit of my own personal opinions. And this may dovetail a little bit. I didn't watch the, the commentary from last week. But this is my overall opinion. I'm just a little tired of the open versus robotic debate for all surgeries. It started with prostates. Now we've moved to bladders. Who knows where we'll go to next? And we're, we're debating about a technique. And I don't think any of the open surgeons are going to get off their you know, high horse and say that robotics is better and vice versa. I think that's just your own personal belief. So what I think is, is that we're, answer, we're asking the wrong questions. Certainly some of these trials, which we'll talk about, are great. They're fi fine trials. And doing a surgical technique-based trial is great, and they should be commended for it. But we really need to focus away from this debate going forward to answer some of the more uh, interesting and important questions in bladder cancer. I believe a surgeon should perform an operation to the best of their ability, regardless of the uh, operative technique. If you do it best open, do it open. If you do it better robotically, do it robotically.
I think bad results can occur with bad techniques, so you must adhere to the basic oncological principles, regardless of your technique, and an instrument, such as a robot, should not determine a surgeon's plan or a surgeon's decision making to take on a case. Therefore, if you're not going to do a bladder and you have a robot, that doesn't mean that we should exponentially increase the providers doing robotic cystectomies. I still believe that you should only do it if you feel comfortable doing it open, because sometimes you can't do them robotically. Um, and we, we, need to, we need to really think about who's, who's doing these. So what we know based on operative techniques. So these, these slides highlight the RAZOR trial. So I believe that Dr. Uh, Bachner from MSK was on that conference that you guys may have tuned into last week. Uh, they did a single institution randomized control trial at Memorial Stone Kettering that resulted in 2015 and 2018. 2015 was the perioperative outcomes. 2018 was the oncologic outcomes. And essentially this randomized patients to a robotic versus open cystectomy, all open diversions at a single center with high volume surgeons. And their conclusions, fairly similar to the RAZOR trial, was there was no difference in perioperative outcomes and no difference in oncological outcomes when these two procedures are done by highly skilled surgeons in one technique or the other. Um, that is used as a quick summary. So this is a RAZOR trial, which essentially did the same thing. The unique aspect of this is this is multi-institutional from a variety of centers across the United States, all arguably high volume centers uh, all with high volume robotic and open surgeons. And this randomized patients in, in, into a, a robotic cystectomy or an open cystectomy. And the, when this was first presented, uh, I think it was like at the AUA in San Diego three or four years ago, um, there was a little bit of a concern before this was actually published that the soft tissue margin rate was eight or 9% in the robotic cohort versus the normal 3% or whatever in the open cohort. This all washed away when you look at the, uh, the Lancet paper where this was all published in because of a pathological re-review. The importance of that, I do not know, but I know that it was there at one point in time. But if we're gonna look, talk about the facts and the facts of the initial study, which is on the left here, is yes, blood loss is a little bit higher in opens. That's gonna play out no matter how you look at robotic versus open. The pneumoperitoneum is helpful from that. The transfusion rate is lower uh, in robotics, perfect. Your hospital stay is a day longer. Is that really moving the needle? In my opinion, length of stay in these arguments, especially in ERAS, is a very, very weak endpoint, especially under uh, the understanding that you do not change your surgical complications. You do not change your low grade uh, or, or minor complications or your major complications when you're looking at robotics versus open. When they extended this, and it's very interesting that they did this randomized controlled trial uh, and then they published their oncologic outcomes in the Journal of Urology, I would have thought that they would have done Lancet, which is normally typical in these situations where one, get, one outcome gets into Lancet, the next one does. Uh, it's a, definitely a better better or more impactful journal, but either way, this was published in the Journal of Urology, and this looked at three-year outcomes of progression-free survival and overall survival. This is a non-inferiority-based trial. So they were, they powered it as such, and as you can see, that there's really no difference in the progression-free survival or overall survival curves, thus suggesting that there is no difference between robotic and open cystectomy in a group of patients that are, or in a group of providers that are high volume and well experienced, which is an outcome that would be expected. So my take homes from these studies is in a group of very well trained surgeons, operative technique for radical cystectomy did not affect morbidity in either of these two randomized control trials uh, or oncological outcome. I believe that the robot should be only viewed as a tool to be used during uh, surgery and uh, it's not really a game changer when it comes to outcomes. And I think it's silly to think that maybe our outcomes will improve with time because of a learning curve. Well, these are, especially when, from the RAZOR trial, these are surgeons that have likely done this for many years prior to this trial. And there are surgeons that have done this for many years open prior to this trial. I just don't think we're going to get more bang for our buck because of a technique with more time. But that is just my opinion. Um, I would have expected to see no difference in progression or overall survival. I think there is a concern 
that we didn't see any difference in low grade or high grade 90 day complications. I think that's just like I mentioned previously, we really need to make changes on this. Um, and then my main take home is can and should these results be extrapolated to community based urologists that are performing cystectomies? What about non neurological oncologists? I just don't think that these results are generalizable based on the people that had helped with completion of the study. So what we know is we need to drastically improve morbidity, but how? Um, we've talked about some, uh, some of these concepts. Prehab is one, that's something I'm interested in. Will it move the needle? I don't know. Probably not that much, but it's certainly something we can do that won't hurt. Patient counseling is big. We'll talk about ERS and the other ones we've already kind of talked about. So prehab is a concept of if we can make a patient better going into surgery, then potentially afterwards they'll be better. And this has been looked at at multiple groups. This, is out of Canada, but uh, the University of Michigan currently has a, a trial uh, looking at this and a few other centers. And essentially, this was a 70, uh, 70 patients, 35 randomized to normal control, 75 randomized or 35 to control, 35 to prehab. Prehab consisted of an exercise regimen, both strength and aerobic, dietary assessment, and anxiety, uh, kind of psychosocial issues. And on their main outcome was recovery, and this was judged based on a six-minute walk test or distance test. And you can see those that got had prehab on the left uh, improved closer to baseline uh, quicker, uh, both at four and eight weeks from those that didn't. However, if you're really looking at moving the needle, did it affect your complication rate? No. Did it affect your readmission rate? No. Did it affect your length of stay? No. Although I don't really like that outcome. Um, it's still maybe not there to change your complication rate and your readmission rate, but it may improve uh, outcomes at, uh, at least from a physical function afterwards. And it, it likely certainly won't hurt for patients to get better dietary uh, counseling, protein supplementation, uh, and exercise prior to surgery. So ERAS is something that has been talked about for a long period of time. This was all uh, came from the colorectal surgery literature. Now we, we're trying to do that here. We have not really done it here yet. We've done some components, um, but not all of them. It's really a, a fairly exhaustive program. Some have 26 elements, 27, 30 elements. Um, to, and in order to maximize patient outcomes, and I believe that most of these, and there are going to certainly be some that are more impactful than others, they're effective for limiting short-term weak endpoints like length of stay, return of bowel function, et cetera. But it's really unclear if ERAS reduces complications or short-term morbidity, and that plays out in multiple studies. And we'll just outline a few that I think are, are good and some that are not. Um, this is just something uh, to outline uh, what we're trying to do here to institute a lot of the different components, but you can see that there's a lot of different things there. Some of them are small, like, hey, you can chew gum within four hours after the surgery. Is that really going to move the needle, improve complications, and get somebody out of the hospital sooner and avoid an ileus? Probably not. Um, but if you have, we know that standardized pathways uh, are beneficial in, in these complex cases. Potentially, we can do some things included here to help. I think the biggest thing that, that has been instituted over the last 10 years is the use of alvimapam or the uh, opioid receptor uh, agonist, antagonist, I can't, I can't remember which one now. But essentially this is a randomized uh, double-blind placebo-based control trial at a large volume centers. We, uh, we helped with this in, in residency and fellowship. And essentially alvimapam can compared to placebo can increase the time or decrease the time to return of bowel function and tolerance of a PO intake. It can reduce the length of stay and it can reduce the rate of ileus, which most complications or a lot of complications can be GI related and most of them are related to ileuses. If you can reduce that, potentially you have a chance to reduce the 30 day to 90 day uh, morbidity or complications. Uh, this is a shout out to, to us and, and Kurt and Laura and other people that, that worked on this. Epidurals used to be in favor uh, in patients undergoing cystectomy and PCAs used to be in favor of patients undergoing cystectomies and aggressive narcotics. And this has been played out from a lot of the research based on uh, from the North Carolina group that we may have heard about today if uh, Dr. Smith would have come. Uh, 
but we overdid narcotics and uh, you know this is a thing from urology and also a thing nationwide and many other surgeries we overdid narcotics and we this is data suggesting that outcomes complication rates are worse in patients that got epidurals and i would probably believe in that they're just not necessary for the majority of patients pcas are probably not necessary for the majority of patients um, even going home on oral uh, narcotics are probably unnecessary or in limited quantities 10 to 20 pills are, are what has actually been modeled and suggested so in combination with albumapan blocking the narcotic effects of, on the GI tract and the minimization of using narcotics post-op are, are probably two of the things that we can really do that, that may drive some of, some of uh, our outcomes. Another thing that I think is interesting is in, in a part of what our, our ERAS and many ERAS protocols are going to say is the volume of interoperative resuscitation. And a lot of this is based on uh, trying to under resuscitate patients or, or low, lower the amount of volume that they're getting in the operation. And this is done kind of twofold. One, limiting the NPO length and duration. I think that's important so you're not providing NPO catch up fluids. And also kind of allowing for a uh, pro, uh, hypotension with the use of vasopressors during the operation. So if you can do less fluid volume, potentially you can get less ileus and less GI complications. This is a small retrospective series from uh, University of South Carolina or uh, University of Southern California that, that kind of dispelled some of those concerns and said it didn't really matter the amount of fluid. I don't really know, but probably less fluid is, is probably better to avoid edema and, and issues with ileus and around your bowel anastomosis. But, so here are my thoughts on ERAS and this is kind of dwindling down the talk. Um, but I think counseling and optimization is important. Prehab, prehab may be an untapped potential. I think patient education is paramount. That's both from an ostomy team support, a nursing support, a surgeon support. We just really don't have time to do all of that though. You also have to talk to them about narcotics and the way that we're going to minimize that. We have to talk about uh, all sorts of different things. We just need a better system in place in order to do that. I think carb loading and limiting MPO duration is key. This prevents the catch up. I think galvilmopam is here to stay uh, and it is beneficial. Uh, we did a study looking at this in our PLNDs and, and we also found that patients that were given alvimopam in addition to scheduled Tylenol and gabapentin had less narcotic use overall. And that was even difference when, we, when you took out the alvimopam only. Um, so when you only gave them uh, Tylenol and gabapentin, Still, that alvimapam showed that if you got that, you still took less narcotics. Now, is that small volume? Is that uh, a single institution study? Yes, but potentially, if you can limit ileus, which can be perceived as pain, uh, which then patients get narcotics for and kind of go into this, this feedback circle, potentially that could be an issue. Um, early mobilization is key. Early, fe early feeding uh, is reasonable. Uh, epidurals really shouldn't be used. We need to do a better job in minimizing our narcotics. Uh, and by and large with this in robotics and earlier discharge is great, but reducing readmissions and minimizing complications really has to be the goal. All right, so uh, three slides on trimodal therapy. This is a treatment with curative intent. There are no head-to-head -head randomized control trials looking at this in surgery alone. Uh, it's relatively unclear if they're similar on oncologic benefits. We look at rates uh, in trimodal therapy versus rates in cystectomies, and potentially they're the same. However, they're a very select group of patients. Uh, once again, we don't, don't really know the morbidity, uh, and it's quite variable. Uh, not all comers are candidates for trimodal therapy, nor should they be offered trimodal therapy. Therefore, selection is key, and it requires a very rigorous follow-up, uh, especially for those patients who are candidates for surgery. So early failures, so this is where split or continuous RT comes in. So split is you get about 40 to 46 gray, and then you do restaging, and if you have uh, current disease within your bladder, you would proceed to cystectomy. Immediate uh, failure is after radiation therapy in the continuous, so you get all your 60 to 64 gray, and then do restaging. And if you have uh, persistent disease in your bladder, you would get consolidated date of surgery. And in the best estimates and the best trials and the best data that we have, up to 25% of patients will still lose their bladder. 
uh, because of persistent local disease, which is obviously much more difficult to do uh, or surgery to do in the radiated field. Uh, optimally, patient selection or optimal patient selection is key. Uh, there are two patient populations that can get trimodal therapy. One is patients with high operative risks due to frailty or comorbidities. That's kind of uh, debated. And then there's also the patients that are fit for surgery uh, but have limited burden, burden disease, adequate bladder capacity, and they have to be very motivated to re retain their bladder. And the best selected patients for this are unifocal disease with less than four centimeters. There's no evidence of gross clinical T3 disease. So look for hydronephrosis. We need better staging, whether this, if this is with MRI or not. But T3 disease is not good for trimodal therapy. It needs a complete and gross resection with TUR. So often when you get these patients referred from outside centers, they do not have a, a complete gross TUR. So that has to be incorporated in their care. We know that CIS does not really respond to radiation therapy nor chemotherapy. Uh, so that is, has been a, a question whether or not we can do this, and I, I would probably not do this in patients with CIS and, and variants. And those patients with variants, we have no idea. Um, the data is far too immature and, and far too low in numbers to suggest that. Having said that, only if you look at the all comers with muscle invasive disease, maybe six, maybe 20% of patients meet these criteria, but we're probably doing this maybe a little bit more often. So we'll we're probably offering this therapy or others are offering this therapy for unselected uh, patients which is probably something we should not do. Um, we talked a little bit about this. The chemotherapy that's radiosensitizing can be either cisplatin and mitomycin, 5-FU or a combination of those. Um, these are the last two slides. So this is the best data. So trimodal therapy has, uh, it's out of the Shipley group. This is out of uh, Mass General and Harvard. And this is looking at their experience in different time periods. They've changed their protocols numerous times and trying to get better results. Um, this is looking at overall survival, A, disease-specific survival, B, and bladder uh, intact survival in C. And you can say the newer, the newer treatments, so the red lines are better in all, and this may be a follow-up issue. But their changes in their, in their protocols are better. Their bladder preservation rates in total are going down. So in their oldest cohort, it was almost 40% had to have a cystectomy anyways. And their intermediate one was about 20, and now they're at about 15. So it's still there. You're never going to get rid of the need for a cystectomy in total in all of these patients. Uh, that's why surveillance, especially surveillance with a urologist is key, and that's probably also something where we all drop the ball. Um, this was one final study is a randomized trial. This is based in England. So before the study was published in England, they used to use solo or uh, single modality monotherapy radiation therapy. That was kind of their dogma uh, in patients that got bladder preservation. And this is a randomized trial looking at uh, chemo radiotherapy. This is radiotherapy alone. And the addition of chemotherapy was beneficial in all outcomes among all comers, and it really did change the way that they approached care, at least in England, and, and also gave uh, evidence to suggest for the rest of the world that if you're going to do bladder preservation, you should do it with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. All right, uh, so in summary, it, muscle invasive bladder cancer is much, much more complex than, hey, this person needs to get a cystectomy, and maybe we'll give them chemotherapy, or maybe we won't. Um, we know that doing nothing, uh, which is common 50% of the time, uh, does not lead to acceptable outcomes. We know that doing something is challenging given the patient population and the morbidity of treatment. We know that curative intent uh, treatment is underutilized and misused at the same time. Uh, we must improve upon the 50% treatment rate, but we must select appropriately uh, patients for treatment courses, and we must improve the tolerability of treatments. We know that surgery is kind of the gold standard for all comers. There's going to be continued debates about the nuances, including the multimodality approach, the surgical uh, approach, the techniques and outcomes. We just need to focus on the important questions and trying to improve upon the morbidity and complication rate. Um, and certainly if we can affect oncologic outcomes, that would be perfect. Um, and then trimodal therapy is a reasonable choice for appropriately selected patients, which may or may not have similar outcomes. But certainly if patients are adamant with muscle invasive disease that they do not want their bladder, uh, 
if they're an appropriate patient, and sometimes you have to kind of uh, stretch the limits, then they should be considered for that because we know the alternatives of doing nothing are not great. All right, so that is all. Uh, sorry about some of the slide things. I'll look at that next time. Thanks, Dr. Callaway. That was a very nice lecture. Thank you. What, uh, yeah, no problem. That was, um, what, uh, there's 20 chats things. Do I need to, do I need to look at this? No. You guys weren't making fun of me or anything like that. No. Uh, what, what, what question uh, uh, do you guys have? Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Callaway, you got this 2019 Star Reviewer Award for Urologic Oncology. Oh, nice. Uh, you and me both. Well, I don't even know how that, how that, that would, they didn't tell me about that. Oh, Just send an email. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, I'm looking through some of these things. Um, so pure squamous uh, cell, Kurt, um, I think it's a good, a good question. A lot. It depends. You know, everyone is uniquely different. We know it's probably cystectomy, but potentially you could consider chemotherapy in that situation. Definitely, at least from data that we had uh, from Indiana, and I think that this is, this is played out through others, is that the urothelials with squamous variants tend to and this is also in the molecular subtypes. Um, the squamous variants tend to respond similar to pure urothelials with new adjuvant chemotherapy. So normally that that would be uh, an argument for new adjuvant ke chemotherapy with the variant of squamous. The peers, I think, is up to debate. Um, small cell LORA, chemo XRT, uh, I just don't know. Uh, we, we did cystectomies in patients after their chemotherapies, and I, I tend to believe that that is appropriate. The XRT, it, it, it's the same component, right? You're trying to treat disease locally, and small cell patients, if they're going to recur, really aren't going to recur uh, the majority of times locally. So they're going to re recur diffusely. So that's really the argument whether or not you need to do anything in that situation. Um, I would tend to do cystectomies. We're going to have one coming up here that of a guy that got uh, XRT for a small cell and still has uh, small cell cancer within his bladder and nowhere else that we're going to have to do a cystectomy, but he's going to have to get a colostomy as well if that's what he wants to do. Uh, I thought what they typically did is they did chemo radiation, see if the patient responded. And if they responded, then, you know, if they had, most of them still have residual disease, so they could get a cystectomy. But if patients have poor response to chemo radiation, then there's no real indication to do a cystectomy because they're likely to have high recurrence rate and no, no real difference in terms of after cystectomy outcomes aside from increased morbidity. Yeah, I mean, I, this is the caveat that I wouldn't do, like, you for patients with small for sure and then patients with metastatic disease at the time of presentation which can happen five to ten percent of the time or so um, if you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy the real role in surgery uh, for a curative intent is those the ones that respond um, so from a small standpoint you can't be growing on it uh, you have to have at least stable or responsive disease within your bladder is what we always would look at and no disease elsewhere. And then that also goes for the same of, of metastatic disease. So if it's metastatic disease local to the pelvis or sometimes even to the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, although this is very questionable, if you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy and those nodes go away, well, what do you do? And... I think it's commonplace to go after it. And those are the times where I would extend my lymph node dissection up to those areas because theoretically there was disease there at one point in time. Now that offers a significant amount of morbidity because 
as some of you have seen, the, the desmoplastic reaction that can happen when nodes are positive and then get wiped away with chemotherapy or immunotherapy or whatever it may be is significant around uh, significant vessels. So it's always quite difficult. But like I said, each case in, in some of these more um, zebras in the whole situation should be treated kind of individually. So, and then you mentioned a lot about female cystectomy in terms of preservation of uh, ovarian preservation and vaginal preservation. So when, when, when you look at data, just like you mentioned, there's less than 4% recur in terms of involvement of the vagina or less than 1% recurrence to the ovaries or primary ovarian cancer afterwards. So in patients who you would consider a neobladder, without trigone involvement and no high, there's minimal, minimal tumor. Would those you consider T1 high grade or T2 with like a solitary tumor to be the candidates for preser preservation of the vagina and ovaries? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be, be smart about it. Um, and then you also have to think about the patient. So the, the patients that can do well with neobladders are very unique, um, in my opinion. They have to be on the healthier spectrum. They're likely going to be a little younger to even be interested in on, in, in on that to begin with. So you're dealing with that. Um, for a female cystectomy, if I was to do it, I would definitely do it at all costs to not enter the vagina. Um, because I think that that's a significant issue, even with the way that I like to, to fold the neobladder and you don't have the opposing staple lines on the back side of the pouch, which would be theoretically beneficial, you can still get fistula. Uh, I've seen it. We're doing it this way or doing it with a, a spiraled neobladder. You can still get fistula between the, the vaginal cuff or the, vag the vagina if you open it and you have to stitch it. Um, that's certainly a spot where you can do mental flaps like I like to do on, on most female cystectomies. Most of the time I do that because they leak uh, from their vagina when you open that and that tries to help prevent the leakage. Um, I'd probably consider leaving ovaries, tubes, uh, cervix, and uterus in those situations too um, because that helps maintain the support uh, the internal support of the vagina so you can help avoid prolapses because prolapses obviously are, are a significant issue when you're removing all of that. And, and I've certainly seen situations where people try to go back in and, and to do some sort of um, repair for prolapse when all of that is removed uh, in patients with neobladder. So I try to do that. The optimal patient, getting back to your question, I think would have to be small anterior dome type lesions that are appropriately motivated and have really good staging. And I would probably have to repeat their cysto TUR myself to like see the extent of all of that. Yes. Do you ever, for prolapse, do you ever do any kind of bladder suspension techniques if you're concerned about prolapse or has anyone done this preemptively instead of going back? Um, I don't know the answer for uh, vaginal uh, preservation. Um, that may have been answered uh, before, but I, it's going to be in low numbers. I think for it's not really a bigger issue if you're going to take the anterior aspect of the vagina and then you kind of flap it back over and nothing else is there. Maybe you'll get an enero seal, but there's really not much much there to to kind of do I, I don't know the answer to that. What's that? No, no. Dr. Kelly, have you ever considered doing like a full RPL and D template for those guys that have like retrocritical lymph nodes even after they've disappeared after chemotherapy? Hold on, Ollie. Okay, I'll talk to you about that after. So Melody asked um, if we would go after the retroperitoneal lymph nodes in a situation where they were presumed positive um, and then got chemotherapy and melted away. Yeah, yes, we've done that. Um, and most of the time in that situation, like I said, it is densely fibrotic and desmoplastic. Um, there is one case I remember completely 
was like one of the last cases that we did in fellowship. Uh, they had retroperitoneal nodes. We did the whole thing. We did a CUR or an Indiana pouch or a CUR. There's a whole day endeavor. Um, we got into the in common iliac artery uh, and had to repair that because everything was just, we kept debating whether we were too thin or not thin. And we just kept debating, are we thin? Are we, uh, like it looks pretty thin and no, we were, we were too thin eventually. Um, it's, it leads to a lot of scarring and all of that was negative. Um, Gene and Albert just helped me with a patient. It was a unique situation where he had had, I think it, the long story short, he had had high grade T1, failed BCG, had BCG and interferon, progressed to muscle invasive, progressed to lymph node disease, got chemotherapy, had a some response, got biopsied in the lymph node, was still positive, got immunotherapy and everything went away. And he was on immunotherapy for a year and eventually he got to go off immunotherapy uh, from costs or complications or side effects. So he was on it for a year and sent to us because in, in the chemotherapy perspective, we would go after it. What about the new era of immunotherapy? Well, he was young and healthy and we decided after talking a lot about it, we'd go after it. And my plan in looking at his in scans is going back all the way to the very beginning of where his nodes were positive and they looked like they were periodic going all the way up. Uh, in the normal fashion, my my thought was is that we were going to do it. Um, on the left hand side, when we got there, it was cement in the pelvis. Uh, from a lymph node standpoint, I mean, I it was a bovi only type of, of case. There was no there's no dissecting. It was just bovying to hopefully not to find it. We were able to expose the external iliac artery, but not the vein. Could never find the vein. We sent some fibrotic tissue. It was fibrosis one time and a negative lymph node in the other, and it was going to be it was going to be multiple hours um, and a lot of morbidity to try to get those nodes out. And then going up higher, you have to think that that was going to be a challenge then too. I just didn't think it was worth it, so we did not do it. But long answer to the question is yes, I've done it. I probably would still continue to do that because the, it's like testis cancer. Um, when I look at uh, imaging. So if it's, if I'm thinking about a modified template, you have to look at all the, the image all the way back. And if you ever, if that patient ever had disease outside of that template, then you know the disease is probably there and it melted away with chemotherapy. So you should do both of them. Um, it has to be an individual discussion, but I'd probably do it. Um, Gina asked a question about an aborted cystectomy, which is never feels good for anybody. Uh, making the decision of when to go forward and not to go forward. And I think some of you have heard me say this. I think most all bladders, it's not, it's not an argument of whether or not it's resectable or not, because most things are resectable. It's just, to, it, it's the collateral damage that you have to do and the potential benefit. So two cases that I think we had recently that kind of help uh, explain this point and say, well, one I aborted and one I went, we went for it is and you open it up and you, you feel the fixed bladder. Um, you certainly have to be able to get it away from the iliac vessels. If you can't get it away from the iliac vessels, then I think that that's a moot point. You should just stop. Uh, if you can't get it away from the rectum, well, the rectum can be, be taken and, and you can do a colostomy. It's something they do a lot of the times in T4 rectal cancers, that's okay. Uh, but you have to assess the whole situation. So one patient got delayed in his neoadjuvant chemotherapy and probably understaged and got delayed in his surgery. And then we opened him and it was fixed. And I felt it. I'm like, ah, we can maybe get this away from the pelvic sidewall. We may have to take the rectum. So you have to talk to the family about that. But then when you look at the ureters uh, in that situation, there was disease and fibrosis all the way up the ureter. So his reconstructive aspects, even if we were going to say, well, let's not uh, he had neph tubes in already, so maybe let's just do a urinary diversion, get the neph tubes out and improve his quality of life. Well, that was going to be a significant challenge, and maybe we wouldn't even have been able to get negative margins on the ureters uh, alone. And then if the left one is shortened, then you're going to have to bring the loop underneath the message. So that's difficult. So that was one I bailed on. Felt bad about it for many days, but alternatively, you know, we were going to put him through a lot of challenge to do that. Um, the other patient had a fixed, uh, fixed bladder we recently did, and we did it um, because he was, he was younger. Um, he had a, a bad squamous uh, cell, and it was bad posterior, and I thought we could probably get it off the rectum, but it was going to be a little dicey. Um, we thought about neoadjuvant chemotherapy in that patient, but he, 
he initially presented with a hemoglobin of three, uh, bilateral AKI needing nephrostomy tubes. And after his creatinine stabilized, uh, he couldn't sleep with the nephrostomy tubes. He couldn't eat with the nephrostomy tubes. And, you know, you have to think about how are they going to get even through a tolerable chemotherapy regimen of at least three or four cycles with gemcitabine and cisplatinum is probably what that guy would have gotten. Would he have been able to do that for three or four months with not sleeping and not eating? And then the chemotherapy is going to run its effects on his, his appetite and his blood counts. Um, we just made the decision to do it. And, you know, I debated and I called Jason beforehand. I'm like, hey, this bladder feels terrible. We could probably get it out, but he hasn't gotten chemo. What should we do? And we both agreed that we should probably just go for it. So I don't know. I don't know. There's no real, there's no real uh, answer to that. It has to just kind of be a, a total assessment of the situation about whether you go for it or not. If you don't go for it, there's not really good options. More of maybe just a straightforward clinical question. When you're discussing uh, with uh, treatment with patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer in the office, are you mentioning bladder preservation or are you mostly kind of trying to feel out if they're good with the cystectomy and going down that path? And then if maybe if they're not, then, then bringing up the more of the talk of, of bladder preservation with trimodal therapy. Yeah. I, so this is a, a biased answer. I normally don't unless I feel like they have the, the characteristics of an optimal candidate for it. So if they have CIS, no. If they have hydro, no. If they have a large tumor, if they have an unresected tumor, uh, normally no. Um, if they appear to be, and that's most of the patients that I get uh, or have gotten, if they appear to be at least on paper to look like criteria, I'll mention it to them um, because I think that that's your obligation. But you have to say it that there is no comparison um, that's readily available between the two techniques. I think a lot of uh, if you send them to medical oncology, and one of the things that has gotten a little bit uh, frustrating is when you send them to medical oncology for new adjuvant chemotherapy, then they also talk with them about that. And I don't really necessarily want them all to be talking about that because I think that's where selection is key. Um, I try to select the patients and talk to them if they're candidates uh, and not talk to them if they're not. Well, they're just offering it as, a, as an alternative and it's not really necessarily an alternative in, in the grand majority of patients. So then they get the idea after they, I send them for new adjuvant chemotherapy and that's what I want, want to happen, but then they come out with the ideas of the bladder preservation, which may or may not be appropriate, and then it's hard to go uh, go back on that. 